Thank you, Rabia, and thank you all for coming. Um, this is, I think, a really crucial session because the coronavirus pandemic and the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor have brought to the forefront of our discussions the economic and the racial inequalities that our community and our nation have been facing for a very long time. The individuals, um, a lot of individuals have, have responded with personal commitments to change and many institutions have made pretty um, bold statements for them uh, to address these issues. And change is often both daunting yet essential. So we're here to talk about what happens now. How does the work of change making happen? What does transforming ourselves and our institutions look like? And how does change align with and honor the commitments that we make as individuals and institutions? And how do we provide grace for each other as we do this work? So we've invited um, three sets of speakers to discuss how their projects are moving intentionally toward change from the pandemic, from racial inequalities and injustice, and or other factors that are facing their specific communities. And so I wanna specifically ask the, uh, thank these teams for accepting the ask and being willing to share um, what you all are doing. And after that, we will um, we'll ask that others of us get real, bring your whole self to the discussion um, and talk and learn with, with and for one another. So, if Maida and Lori would kick us off, please, and thank you. Thank you, and good afternoon or um, good morning, depending on where you are. Um, and thank you for inviting us to talk about our project. While we are starting up here, Lori will be sharing her screen and looks like we are up and um, going. My name is Maida Chawa Dijas, and I'm an instructor of anthropology at New and Area Community College. Ours is a collaborative project and my co-PI as well as my co-presenter today is Lori Collins from the Digital Heritage and Humanities Collection at the University of South Florida. We would like to acknowledge the traditional homelands of the indigenous peoples where we work and live. I'm calling in from central Iowa whose original custodians are the Bahuchi or Iowa, Meskwaki and Sauk people. And Lori is calling in from Florida the traditional homelands of Seminole people. Our project also includes collaborators who share their indigenous traditional knowledge systems with us from the Gabriel and Tongwa people of the Los Angeles area, the Tlingit people of the Southeast of Alaska, the Yupik and Inupak people of the Bering Strait region of Alaska and the Sami people of Norway and Finland. Our project brings together 14 team members to explore the ethical use of 3D technology in the preservation of indigenous ancestral heritage. We are looking at the 3D digitization, dissemination, and printing of indigenous material heritage, but we are also looking at the potential ethical issues that may arise from using these technologies. So for this reason, we are not actually engaging in 3D digitization in this project, and instead we created a team whose members already have experience with 3D technologies. And so we are bringing multiple identities to our discussion, and this is what allows us to draw on our past experiences in digital heritage preservation, computer science, and working with indigenous communities. In our project, we follow indigenous data governance principles, which is what we would like to focus on today. And Lori, could you please go ahead and go to the next slide? Okay. Um, so our discussion will resonate with many of the topics that we have uh, been listening to and that were brought up in the past two days in the keynotes as well as in the wonderful breakout sessions. So when we are considering what would be the most needed transformation in our field, we thought about the challenges when discussing that our project supports indigenous data sovereignty. We use the care principles to guide us in considering the ethics of ownership, access, and reuse of 3D data. And Lori will be putting the link to the uh, Global Indigenous Data Alliance care principles, as well as Kavarak Inc.'s co-production of knowledge framework that I will be mentioning here in a second, it will be in the chat. So Kavarak Inc. is the Alaska Native Nonprofit Tribal Consortium in the Bering Strait region, and they are actually a sub-awardee sub on our project. When we share about our project, we are often challenged on supporting Indigenous data governance, and this challenge often comes particularly from STEM contacts. 
these challenges usually center around the idea if NSF or other any other agency funds a project, then the data that comes out must be publicly available, open access data, which of course doesn't work with indigenous notions of ownership, access, or even what research is. So the approach we suggest, and which we also use in our collaboration, is co-production of knowledge framework uh, that could benefit not only collaborating with indigenous communities, but broad, more broadly, any community-engaged project. And this approach was developed by one of our team members, Julie Raymond Kubian, um, and her collaborators, Carolina Behe and Rachel Daniel. So the framework includes intentional participation through equity in design process and data dissemination. And because all participants come together with the intention to contribute, they negotiate their shared goals. And those goals are continually revisited to make sure they still fit the expectations. And that includes discussion on what type of data the project will produce and what type of access sharing and reuse will be appropriate for that data. So to give you an example, a quick example, of course, there are already protections for certain types of data, such as human participant data. But what constitutes human participant data in an indigenous knowledge system can be very different from what is in the federal IRB regulations. So there needs to be an intentional discussion on the expectation and what is culturally appropriate to share and with whom. And so this allows for a full uh, inclusion of indigenous data governance from the very beginning of any project. Several of our keynote speakers expressed hope that the outcomes from ongoing work that disrupt existing power relations will be the cornerstone of research ethics in the future. And we certainly join them in this hope, as well as in this process by working towards changing our field. So indigenous data governance does become the norm for all of these projects. On a broader scale, we can co-produce knowledge with our community partners that help us understand different perspectives of what research, data, or data stewardship are, what do those mean to all collaborators and across multiple knowledge systems. And I would like to turn it over to Lori and she will walk us through to our, our strategies of how we try to make this happen. Thank you, Maida. And I just wanted to apologize. I'm having problems getting to the chat feature to share those links when I'm sharing my screen, apparently. So we'll Maida, go ahead and I'll share them. I'll share them. Okay, great. Thanks. Hi, I'm Lori Collins. I'm with the University of South Florida, where um, I am in a center for digital heritage and um, digital heritage and humanities collections. Um, and I'm a co-PI on this wonderful project with Maida. And we'll be sharing with you a little bit more in detail about how our project um, is really uh, applying some indigenous data governance principles that she's talking about. But also I wanted to reflect a little bit on um, the idea of transformation. Um, that is so much part of what we've been discussing the last couple of days. Um, when in the public domain, data from 3D and imaging and spatial technologies and um, all of this virtualization and potential that we've been talking about and seeing and has been brought up repeatedly really um, throughout this conference as well, you know, so much promise for the future with all of this. Um, but there's also a lot of ethical implications that really need to be considered, not just for today or the near future, but really prognosticating and thinking about the far future. Um, with a lot of these technologies. And so, um, you know, this idea of unintended consequences, let's say that they're not even purposeful consequences that can result from things like geospatial data um, or, or three-dimensional kinds of uh, metrology measurement kinds of data um, that can create issues and conflicts where we might not have considered that. Things like looting, for example, can be perpetuated or accelerated when geospatial data information is made totally open access and available. Um, things like cultural appropriation and misuse that can result from the sharing openly or democratization, if you will, you hear that term a lot. Um, those kinds of uh, ways of sharing three-dimensional data may have very unintended consequences or implications for the future that, that must be thought about. Um, and so I think transformationally, our group is really trying to look at not only how, how we are thinking about cooperating and coming together around projects and ideas, but also 
how we're really thinking about these words that we're using like access and um, democratization and what that might mean for communities. And um, so the idea of, you know, co-production and access, you know, all of these words that we've been using, I think that when you link that to the technology that we've been talking or that, that we're focused on in our project, um, that's, that's where we want to try to look at some of these consequences and really explore the idea. And I have a couple of examples from projects that my team um, has worked on. We said we weren't really creating 3D data, but most of our um, participants have this 3D experience that they're bringing to the team. And so um, in many cases, some of us have already worked on things together. And um, so we've done things like um, participate in a sharing our knowledge conference where we've worked with clans on um, documenting both sensitive and materials that they're willing to share open access. So this doesn't preclude open access or this doesn't preclude ideas and concepts around democratization. It just lets us be much more thoughtful about it. And so I think that um, the result and the thing that, you know, we're, we're kind of early in our process with this, um, but as Maida mentioned, um, some of the things that we're doing is really looking at engaging these different groups around the idea of digital born and indigenous data and how um, communities can explore the opportunities and the possibilisms that are there for these technologies, but also really critically analyze. Um, and if you don't have an understanding of, you know, what are those implications from both sides of that conversation of, um, and that includes even industry and developers that really need to have an understanding for um, prognosticating what are the implications of this technology. Um, more fully. And so I think the way that we've approached this is to kind of co-produce and come together around the idea of developing um, a set of ethical considerations for this that would guide our research principles and, and conduct. And um, not just um, from the research side of it, but on the consumption side of it and, and who's using these data and also on things, you know, critically looking at things like longevity and shelf life and archiving and, you know, um, how does data continue to, to live and, and um, move into the future. And so for us, a very important part of this process, and hopefully we'll see this resonant in all of the groups, is really that stakeholder analysis and kind of looking at who's participating and, and what they're um, bringing and able to um, reflect on uh, has been a big part of this. And it includes really um, groups, policymakers, and the end users of this as well. So um, that's really uh, what I wanted to get across from, from this and tie together with these sort of broader perspectives that we've been seeing and, and talking about um, for the last few days. And hopefully this will, will spark areas for, for more conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Maida and Lori. Now we will turn to Lori and Jay. Hi, um, I'm Lori Giratani. Did I successfully share my screen with our map indeed. here of our project? Thank you. Um, so I'm the Director of Education at Carnegie Museum of Natural History. Jay Russell and I are going to share some snapshots of our learning from the Climate and Rural Systems Partnership. So the goal of CRISP is to support conversations about climate change between people with different perspectives. And our project is structured in a research practice partnership that has a core team of three organizations in three locations here in Western Pennsylvania. Um, we work with learning scientists at the University of Pittsburgh who help uh, Jay and I and our teams reflect on what we do, um, kind of find and synthesize and help us use literature and methodology for examining what we're learning. Um, and at the museum, we've got ecologists who are involved in some co-production work uh, with the participants in our project to help find relevant data collections and science resources that will support climate conversations. And educators at the museum and Powder Mill Nature Reserve, which is our field station, um, we all work together to develop workshops that'll bring this expertise together. 
Um, and then Jay and his colleagues in the Mercer County Conservation District bring their expertise in soil health and conservation, as well as environmental education, um, and a really strong network of community partners. Um, so this core team across these um, organizations were supporting a wider network of individuals and organizations who want to integrate conversations about climate change into their work. Um, and so we've got two hubs, which are here on the map. Um, one that is um, centered um, with Jay and his group in the Shenango area in Northwestern PA, and then one that's out at our field research station in the Laurel Highlands. Um, and this work builds on a prior project, um, the Climate and Urban Systems Partnership, where we convened similar networks of um, different kinds of experts, and we are focused on um, supporting conversations about climate adaptations in cities. And we learned a lot in that project, but also realized that we were missing a big piece um, of the climate resilience story. So um, really our project um, is about how these collaborations will help all of our organizations grow um, and help our region um, better connect on this really important conversation. Um, so with that said, I'm gonna turn it over to Jay to share kind of a few snapshots of what this learning has looked like um, in our project. Uh, thanks, Lori. Um, Jay Russell, um, the uh, district manager for the Mercer County Conservation District. Um, and our uh, hub, uh, we affectionately call S-Crest, which is the Shenango um, Climate Rural, uh, I always get this uh, study team, essentially. Um, the, the group gave it that name, but it, it, it gave us a, a, a S Crest is our affectionate name we, we go by for our hub. Um, we, we developed uh, the group uh, developed you know through the process these discussion norms. Um, you know our hub has uh, approximately seventy five people we contact uh, to potentially participate in meetings uh, and when we get together. So we wanted to have a uh, you know these norms for everybody so that they could feel like it was a safe place to come and talk about climate change. Um, sometimes those discussions and even in our group have gotten into um, where people don't always agree and, and that's okay in some ways but as long as we follow the rules and we can have a nice discussion it works well. Um, you know uh, the other thing is some people don't talk as much uh, as other people and being mindful of that take space make space we love that one because we have definitely people in our group that love to talk and you know some people that don't um you know except non-closure a lot of our discussions go but they don't ever find a, a way to finish necessarily in that meeting or other meetings uh and, and definitely support and, and and you know challenge each other to to do better and, and to have good uh conversations about the topics we're we're, we're having um I'm a community member in a way uh, on this project, uh, you know, and, and that's that's something that, um, you know, we were, uh, Lori and the, and the group from, from Carnegie reached out to us and we jumped into it, uh, kind of not knowing what we were getting into, but it's been a great, uh, great project for us. And, and, and now we've changed uh, our organization. So, um, so the next thing is uh, take a stand. Um, we didn't develop this personally from my office, but the group did. Um, and, uh, you know, it came to us. Uh, sometimes people don't, you know, necessarily want to have large discussions about things. Uh, sometimes we want to choose uh, maybe questions that not everybody wants to have big, long discussions about. Uh, this was an opportunity uh, where we could uh, facilitate questions to the group and everybody could you know, kind of take a stand, move to that location, whether you agree or disagree, uh, some range on that. Um, and you can just move to that location. That's basically how you're communicating. Uh, it's worked really well in some of our, our new groups that we've went out and talked to where we can get together, and have a, a question about how people feel about climate change or, you know, who's doing enough or not doing enough. And they can kind of go through that. And it's that their individual, um, you know, vote, you would say, in that process. And we can look at that. Um, even to where we, we had an activity at our local fair um, where we, you know, are you concerned about climate change? We had that question up there and, and participants were able to come through 
and just uh, put a, a puff ball into the, into the uh, uh, can that, that uh, was the way they felt. Uh, it was a really nice way to give people a chance to respond to the question and not have you know, somebody, how do you feel, all those type of things. We did talk to them, but um, it gave them a chance if they didn't want to talk, they could still have a vote and, and get into the conversation that way. So it was a really nice way to get individual uh, information from people, whether it's public or, or members within our group to do that. So it was a nice little, nice little project uh, um, facilitation that, that was put together for, for several of our, our, our events. So, all right, and I will turn it back to Lori, thanks. Yeah, so I, ju I just briefly um, want to show you this slide. Um, one of our mottos that we use when we work across teams is kind of running ideas through the CRISPR. Um, so we've got six really core ideas um, that we try to touch on across the work that we do. Um, but the two that I have highlighted here being open to personal feelings and also paying attention and being grounded in evidence these have been, I think, a good tension for our group, particularly um, at the museum with our work across science and education. Um, so for the ecologists on our team, um, and also the scientists who are part of our network, it's been challenging to acknowledge that science alone is not enough to move the needle on climate change. Um, they've been very, you know, we've been learning together how important feelings and mindset are to this work um, and sometimes setting science aside to focus on those things first. Um, at the same time for the educators on our team who normally like center our feelings and start with personal connections, um, we've been really using science in new ways. Um, the ecologists we work with use um, co-production methodologies and are really interested in helping us find data that like our network members are asking for and want to use. Um, so we're, um, just, you know, just kind of wanted to share that example. It's personal learning, but also in our work at the Natural History Museum, it's helping push our organization. Um, and data is really essential to the work um, at the Conservation District as well. Um, so yeah, I, don't, I feel like we're kind of getting close on time, maybe out. All right. So thanks. I'll put our contact info into the chat if anyone wants to get in touch and we'll turn it over to the next group. Thank you, Lori and Jay. And now I turn it over to Neonu, Jay, and Victory. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here with us this evening. This um, program is a youth directed math collaboratories and mathematical identity, African American youth as co learners, co educators, and co researchers. This project is um, collaborated, being collaborated with the Baltimore Algebra Project, the symbol you see to your left, and then a Young People's Project, the, the logo you see to your right. Next slide. Our students' culture. For most of our students, the culture of school is not their culture. The culture of school for them is something they encounter somewhere else. It's imposed, uncomfortable, and confusing. And the Baltimore Algebra Project and the Young People's Project. However, outside of school time, the culture of learning is the student's culture. It's a culture of power, of oneness and responsibility. It is a culture that allows them to be a part of and not apart from. Next slide. Mathematics is and has always been a part of um, of our students' culture because we are human. When you look at these beautiful pictures, you can, you can see African culture throughout it. You can see math throughout it. You can see in the drum, the beats, having to, um, the one drummer having to line and be in um, harmony with the next drummer. You can see the patterns and the shape in the patterns in the African print. And you can see this beautiful young lady with her beautiful braids and they have to be braided evenly. Math is all throughout African culture. African culture is mathematics. Next slide. But the formulizations of school mathematics are, are hard to learn because the culture of school is filled with negative judgment and coercion. School is currently focuses on what to learn and not how to learn. They also miss the enormous teaching contributions that young people can make for their peers and others. Next slide. 
The Young People's Project and the Baltimore Algebra Project used more than two decades of experience to advance a different relationship of math and culture. This image shows a mathematician running the flagway structure for his team. The flagway structure is based on the Mobius function that you see below. Next slide. The key features of YPP, the Young People's Project, and BAP, the Baltimore Algebra Project, um, cultures are young people are paid for sharing their knowledge and skills with peers. The majority of NSF funding for the project goes to young people and also to graduates of the program in training and researchers role. Young people determine how they organize their own work to achieve their, their purposes. So quick story. I am not only a, um, I did not only work for the Baltimore Algebra Project as a youth, but I'm also here as a graduate. <laughs> Uh, of the Baltimore Algebra Project. I started off as being tutored and then I became a tutor. And then from that, um, and feeling, feeling empowered in that, I joined what, what we would call at that time, not that long ago, the Advocacy Committee. And at that time we were fighting for funding for Baltimore City Schools because Baltimore school, City Schools are currently owed millions of dollars. And at that time, old millions of dollars. Um, so we were fighting for funding. We were getting together with other young people. We were galvanizing schools across the city. Um, so I went from there to become a national organizer, organizing with other young people across the country around similar issues. And then I went from there to be, um, well, I went, off, I went away for school. And then as I came back, I came back to the Algebra Project as a um, assistant teacher in a math classroom, as a um, in a in a math classroom in an um, alternative school, and it has been a very rewarding experience to go from tutor to tutor to uh, a national organizer, and just as a youth feeling empowered and feeling confident and knowing that I can do that. But because before I came for to the Algebra Project, I did not know that my voice mattered. I did not know that what I had to say would um, bring solutions, or even that it was my responsibility to um, empower myself and empower un other young people by saying, this is what I'm owed and this is what I deserve. So next slide. We will be studying mathematical identity in peer and near peer teachers, researchers across four dimensions, Audiobiographical, discursal, authorial, and social cultural. Next slide. Audiobiographical identity. These are the stories that students will tell um, their own mathematical lives. So at the beginning of our project, at the beginning of each year of our project, we will have the students um, tell their mathematical story, how they relate to math, what do they think when they hear, hear math, or just their um how they identify with men, right? And how that changes throughout time. So next slide. Discursal identity. This is how young people change their communication and action with peers, their families and what they do at the home and in the community throughout their work with men. It is also how other people shape their speech and action when they are with the young people doing men. Next slide. Authorial identity. This is how long young people take control of mathematical ideas as opposed to just repeating what a teacher, a textbook, or a website says, inventing their own language and terms for mathematical experiences and objects, and inventing and sharing their own mathematical concepts. It is them taking the, the authority, the authority in their math, the authority in their own lives, saying that it is my responsibility for um, my mathematical experience, and it's my responsibility. I am. Uh, I hold responsibility in um in my culture as a whole. Next slide. Social culture identity. This is how young people come to understand math as a part of their history and culture, and in particular how they see themselves working in the traditions of their Black freedom struggle and human rights. Oh my goodness. This just made me think. Okay, I'm sorry. I did not introduce the rest of my team, which is a part of my team. Jay Gillen and Mama Victory, because um, she's going to uh, add to this slide. Oh my goodness, don't kill me, guys. That's all right. <laughs> I'm so excited. Uh, yes. This is Victory Swift. 
uh, a part of the social cultural identity for our young people is to get, let them know how powerful their contribution through history has been uh, via the American culture, how powerful their culture is and their, and their contributions are to this nation and how powerful moving forward their contribution will be in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mama Victory. You're welcome. At the center of the work and culture is, you see our family, our community, and we're always supporting the power of the youth. Thank you. Excellent, wow, thank you all. Okay, so I am, um, what I'm supposed to do is uh, reflect on what you all collectively have said uh, in real time right now. So what I'm going to do, which is gonna buy me a minute, is I would like everyone to think what, and this is to prep for our small group discussions. Write down or at least note one question and one comment. One question that you would like to hear more from someone else, it may be not the speaker, but you'd like to hear more on a topic. Um, and the other thing is, what do you have to contribute to the conversation? And we'll take a minute to do that before, before I comment and also before we get into small groups. Thumbs up if you've had enough time to at least begin the process of thinking about this. Okay, thank you all. Okay, so, um, wow. So I heard three major themes. Um, well, I'm gonna focus on three major themes. I heard the theme of multiple uh, multiple tension integration. So I'll, I'll expand on that in a minute, but the, the multiple identities, the recognizing um, multiple ways of knowing, what counts as evidence, uh, what counts as knowledge. So there's the one is multiple. The other I heard, the second is voice. So what kind of table is it? What is the function of, of, of the, the table? Who is comfortable in this space? So it's, it's, it's voice, I guess it's voice and comfort. And then the third is growth. The idea of non-closure and what we're working with right now may work for now, or we're living in something that worked in the past. Um, and so growth. So the multiple identities, the voice and comfort and growth. So let me speak a moment. Um, I'm gonna start with multiple. So Maida and Lori talked about multiple identities. The fact that, we, and this carries through, you know, you know that, we're, the, that we have academic identities. But more than that, we have people, personal identities, who we are as people and what we know and what we value in these multiple identities I think came through all, was a thread all the way through. When Jay and Lori were talking about um, voting in the can, with the cans and, um, you know, what, and, and the fact that people have to be open to both their personal feelings and what they count as evidence. I think those multiple identities and what role we're having at any one time affects our, per, our perception of how comfortable we are about expressing feelings 
and talk and what we count as evidence at any one time. And I think that goes to what Neonu and um, Jay and Victory were also talking about of, of who's doing math and how is math related to ourselves and even how we talk about math. Are we talking about math in an academic or a school setting where we're comfortable or are we talking about math in our home setting or in our, in, in our community setting where we may still be, where we may not use the term math, but those, that kind of knowledge and the skills, we may use different terms for it, but it really is, it has as its essence, a lot of the same pieces. So this, this multiple, it's not either or, it's both and, it has tension and it has con cohesion because we are people and we are community and we are functioning, but yet it's all of these different ways. And the fact that we have to, in our daily lives, we thread ourselves through all those different ways of knowing, all those different feelings, all those different um, communities in our being. So the next topic I want to, to go to, actually I'm gonna go to growth now. Um, and I'm going to start with the federal government. Democratization of science right now is one of a key principle that's coming out um, uh, of the federal government. How do people have access to what their, ta their tax dollars have paid for? How do we ensure um, that the government isn't overreaching. Hence the IRB, the, the, the Internal Review Boards, is, at, is not held at the, at the federal government. It is held externally to the federal government because of the T T Tuskegee experiment and other ways the federal government has overstepped. And so when we look at indigenous sovereign, sovereignty and governance, and we think about the unintentional consequences. We think about how, how IRB was put in place for one purpose, and yet now it is not always serving. It, it, it was put in place to, as a forward thinking mechanism to solve problems of the past and set a course for the future. And yet now we are recognizing, and this is why it's in the growth category, we are recognizing that we need to continue to revisit our ethics and our knowledge and how we understand our values and how it is applied to our culture and our communities in our research and in all aspects of our lives. And I think this came through in terms of the work with climate change and rural systems um, in terms of how do we keep the discussion going? That non, accepting non-closure in order to keep the discussion going. What kind of small spaces do we need to create in order to have those large space conversations? That it's not an either or, that if we are going to continue to grow, if we are going to allow our ethics to inform our work, we have to keep those spaces open. And I think that goes to what Neonu, um, Victory and Jay were talking about in terms of the personal, it also includes the personal trajectories. So where am I as an individual and who am I influencing and who am I becoming in order to have a role in this growth? So, our, so I started by talking about the, the federal government and our national community and then started talking about the local community, the more local communities that have a, a global impact as well as a local and national impact. And now the individual, the individual as someone who can grow, who can also build community, who can also have an effect on our nation. And so that's growth. And then I wanna, I wanna end with saying, I wanna end with talking about voice. And that's that place, and I want to start with what Neonu and Jay and Victory were talking about, whose culture, where are we comfortable, and who is com comfortable where. So we 
are part of culture. We create culture. We enculturate other people. There is this tension of what is all going on with culture. And in many, many times, um, what we're, and I'm going to go back to NSF because that's what I know best right now. We, when we hear reviewers talking about, we, we hear projects that talk about, you know, we're looking at this topic, but it isn't engaging the people. It's doing things to people. It wants to do people things to people, not with people. It is not honoring the knowledge, the culture, the being, the growth that has happened and can happen. And so thinking deeply about how our projects, who is comfortable where, and when are we putting ourselves in uncomfortable positions? This goes back to growth so we can grow. What kind of tables are we creating? So I think I've gone over my five minutes, um, but thank you all. I, I thank you deeply for being willing to engage in this conversation um, together with us. And now I think Rabia, we're ready for breakout rooms. Um, and hopefully you all will continue and do go back to your first comments, um, your first thoughts, because those are probably the most productive for you as an individual and then see how it plays out in the larger context. So thank you all. Thank you deeply for being here.